So in this session, we're going to dive into some of the abnormal findings. Um, obviously, we've already heard uh, a little bit about that, but I'm going to give a general overview, and then we have some uh, lectures that will focus more uh, specifically on some of the uh, abnormal ECG findings in athletes. Uh, again, um, this comes from the international recommendations, and we're going to focus on this uh, red box of abnormal ECG findings. In this specific talk, we won't have a chance to go through all of them, um, but we will um, highlight some of the uh, more common things that we might find. One of the questions that comes up that, that, that I also had to reflect on are, are what are the key changes um, between the Seattle criteria uh, and the international criteria? And I, I listed them here, and, and there may be some others sort of hidden in the document, but I think these are some of the key ones. So first, you know, we've already talked a lot about uh, adding uh, juvenile T inversion into the green box um, between the Seattle criteria and the international criteria, important change. Um, a, a second change, the introduction of a yellow box or borderline findings that includes right bundle branch block uh, axis and atrial enlargement in which two or more of those findings or any single abnormality in the red box uh, would require more evaluation. We have a new definition of pathologic Q waves which I think is super important and has helped us a lot with our specificity. Um, also want to point out that uh, T wave inversion in V5 or V6 alone warrants more investigation. In the past, we've always looked at T-wave inversion as two or more contiguous leads. That still is true with the exception of V5 and V6 where just a single lead of T-wave inver inversion um, should attract our attention and more evaluation. We also added an epsilon wave uh, to the red list. It's something that we'll go over in, in some of the advanced ECG interpretation uh, uh, sessions. Um, and then also in the international criteria, start to discuss findings that might warrant evaluation for occult coronary artery disease in athletes over 30 years old. And then I think um, one also difference between the Seattle criteria and the international uh, recommendations of late are, are that the new recommendations um, clearly talk more about secondary testing and, and link the ECG abnormality to the specific uh, evaluation that we'd recommend. In terms of uh, that evaluation, uh, I think it's ideally performed in consultation with a specialist um, who has some experience in distinguishing athletes' heart from disorders um, associated with sudden cardiac death. Again, super important to understand the precise definition of what we're calling uh, abnormal on those ECGs. Um, this is from table one in those uh, uh, international uh, uh, criteria. Um, and today we're going to uh, focus uh, mostly on T wave inversion, ST segment depression, and pathologic Q waves, and a little bit on pre excitation, and then some other sessions uh, cover the rest. We've seen ECGs like that, uh, this this morning. I think no one would argue that this is a, a normal ECG. Uh, this is an ECG that shows infralateral T-wave inversion um, in, in leads uh, V4, V5, V6, and, and then uh, one in AVL as our lateral leads, and then two in AVF as our inferior leads. Uh, I'll take a moment here and walk through how my eyes roll through an ECG. I think when we um, grew up in medical school, we sort of learned the rate rhythm axis, PQRST um, scenario. There was sort of a gap between my, my education on ECGs and then looking at ECGs in athletes. And my assumption when I look at an ECG in an athlete is that it's going to be normal. And what I'm really looking for are some of the things that would flag it as abnormal. So my eyes start in the precordial leads, and I look at V1, 2, 3, and, and beyond. And I'm looking specifically think for things that would flag this as an abnormal ECG. So pathologic Q waves, uh, ST segment depression, or T wave inversion. And I walk through um, all of the QRS complexes and those leads. Obviously, we find our ST segment depression and, and T wave inversion here, um, and so forth. And then I move over to um, the other side of the ECG, looking at our limb leads, uh, starting with AVF, sort of up to AVL, over to uh, lead two, and up to lead one. Again, looking for pathologic Q waves, SC segment depression, and T wave inversion. Um, why do I not stare too long at lead three? Well, we've excluded some things from lead three that um, are, are just more common uh, occurrences in lead three and not necessarily an abnormal finding, specifically Q waves and T wave inversion. Once I've gone through looking for Q waves, SC segment depression, and, and T wave inversion, I'll, I'll then go back to more how we learned to look at the ECG, um, looking at the limb leads for the, the axis, um, for uh, atrial enlargement perhaps, and then looking at the rhythm strip at the bottom um, for the rhythm, and then a calculation of the QT interval that we're going to hear more about uh, later. <laughs> 
Here's another example of uh, lateral T-wave inversion and ST segment depression, again in uh, V4, V5, V6, showing uh, a pretty deep T-wave inversion. Uh, deep is really defined as more than two millimeters or two small boxes, uh, which occurs uh, in these lateral leads. Again, important to link our abnormalities to what that recommended evaluation is. We, we've already uh, alluded to this, and we're going to hear more from, from Dr. Owens in just a bit. Um, but in this uh, ECG, the recommendation is an uh, echocardiogram, cardiac MRI, and then for gray zone findings, uh, uh, ambulatory ECG monitor or Holter, uh, and cardiac stress testing. Here's an example of, of lateral T-wave inversion again. Um, this is a sort of a markedly abnormal ECG with T-wave inversion greater than two millimeters again on the outside. I will bring up uh, the concept here that in the lateral leads, the ST segment is flat or downsloping uh, in comparison to some of the other um, uh, T-wave inversion that we see in the precordial leads here, where it almost looks like that black repolarization variant uh, in the anterior precordial leads and may represent that, but as we go out laterally, this is clearly an abnormal pattern. In the document in Table 2 are the recommendations that, that again, uh, link a specific ECG abnormality with the potential cardiac diseases we're looking for, the recommended evaluation, and some of the considerations. Um, and, and we're going to um, dive into this in, in greater detail. But I did just want to point out that the, the, the consensus panel um, did agree that a cardiac MRI would be a routine diagnostic test for this type of ECG phenotype. So a markedly abnormal ECG with lateral or infralateral T-wave inversion or ST-segment depression um, where uh, an MRI would be a standard part of that initial evaluation. Here's an example um, that is uh, uh, more subtle. Um, where we have lateral T-wave inversion in only um, uh, sort of V4 and then extending into V5. This is where uh, maybe slightly in V6, but this uh, T-wave inversion is not quite as obvious. And, and what do you do for this in terms of an evaluation? Uh, you know, at a minimum, we're going to get an echo. And then the question that came up in our, in our last um, uh, panel discussion is, what if we don't have access to a cardiac MRI or limited resources or who gets a cardiac MRI? Um, I think that um, is a very uh, good question and sometimes challenging. Um, when we, when our recommendation for cardiac MRI is, is for um, more of the deep T-wave inversion, which is greater than 2 millimeters, uh, certainly in any ECG with concurrent ST-segment depression or other ECG abnormality, um, or um, based on um, non-diagnostic or, or concerning findings on your echo. and so. For sort of subtle lateral T wave inversion, uh, for sure cardiac MRI is going to give you the most information uh, along with your echo. Um, but but uh, undoubtedly in this group with, with deeper T wave inversion or other ST segment abnormalities, I think it has to be a must. And then obviously that emphasis on serial uh, or annual evaluation um, for individuals with this type of ECG phenotype. We've seen this ECG before that has a lot of different abnormalities on it. Uh, ST segment depression, T-wave inversion. It also has uh, examples of uh, atrial enlargement, uh, both left atrial enlargement as well as uh, right atrial enlargement. Um, Dr. Policia uh, published in 2008 uh, a study that, that uh, gave us a lot of information on why we need to follow these athletes who have a markedly abnormal ECG but an initial normal workup. Their cardiac imaging, their cardiac morphology is normal. There's, there, there's no um, imaging diagnosis of cardiomyopathy. So they followed a group of 81 athletes over a nine-year time period with a markedly abnormal ECG, and this is what they, what they found. Seventy of them uh, continued to have uh, no symptoms and no disease. Six of them were diagnosed with other cardiovascular diseases. But importantly, in that red box, 6% um, of them over time developed a cardiomyopathy, um, one, a few HCM, ARBC, or, or DCM. And so very important to understand that the electrical manifestations of a cardiomyopathy may actually show up first before the morph morphologic features that will give you a more um, uh, confirmed diagnosis. So very important to follow these individuals long term. I'll ask you here, when you look at this ECG, is it normal or abnormal? I think pretty quickly our eyes may go to the, the, the lateral leads, um, where we, infralateral leads, where we can see um, two-wave inversion that would make this uh, an abnormal ECG. Um, and let's not be fooled that there may well be in this black athlete some normal repolarization that's going on as well, uh, as well as the abnormal findings beyond that. <laughs> 
Again, um, that black uh, athlete physiologic uh, repolarization variant is always confined to leads uh, V1 through V4. In contrast, pathologic T wave inversion uh, will extend beyond uh, V4 um, and, and move beyond into V5, V6. Also shown here again, if we look at the, the um, J point and ST segment, um, for the pathologic uh, example here, it, it nicely shows that that SC segment is basically flat or downsloping in contrast to a J-point elevation um, with a domed or, or convex SC segment. Anterior T-wave inversion, this is an example uh, of someone who ultimately was diagnosed with ARVC. Um, this is in a 21-year-old 20, uh, Caucasian male, so, so out of the range where we can say this is juvenile T-wave inversion, it also extends beyond V3 and into V4. Um, the, the arrows are pointing not at the T-wave inversion, but really at the non-elevated J-point and non-elevated ST segment prior to uh, the T-wave inversion. Inferior T-wave inversion, when you look at this ECG, is it normal or abnormal? Um, and this is one of the, the, I would say, sort of challenges or, or challenging ECGs or perhaps pitfalls that we might fall into. In this particular ECG, we see T wave inversion in, in ABF and also in lead three. But to truly meet the definition of inferior T wave inversion as we've defined it in the international recommendations, it has to be um, two contiguous leads and in the inferior leads that be two in ABF because we exclude lead three. So this ECG, if I was seeing it in an asymptomatic athlete, would not require more evaluation and wouldn't be flagged as an abnormality. And I think that's also supported by some of the work that Sanjay has alluded to uh, may come down uh, in the future. In contrast, this example of inferior T wave inversion would be considered abnormal um, with T wave inversion in AVF and lead two, two contiguous leads and, and currently require um, further evaluation beginning with an echocardiogram. So let's talk about the new criteria for pathologic uh, Q waves. Um, the old criteria is out. This is an example of the old criteria where basically greater than three millimeters in depth um, or uh, duration greater than 40 milliseconds was considered an abnormal um, Q wave. The problem with this is that everyone with high amplitude uh, voltage associated with um, uh, being an athlete or, or LVH and uh, um, athletic uh, adaptation often had some sort of long, skinny Q waves. So we were frequently calling this type of ECG uh, abnormal, getting workups, and um, never finding pathology. And so the, the, the new criteria, which is definitely uh, much better, uh, goes back to stuff that, that we've had before, um, looking at uh, HCM uh, from 1998 with Dr. Corrado, um, looking at a QR ratio of 25% uh, or 0 0.25, so basically where the, the, Q5, the Q wave is greater than 25% of the ensuing R wave um, or greater than 40 milliseconds in duration, so a wide uh, uh, Q wave. This is another example of pathologic Q waves based on the new criteria, again, um, if you look at the, the Q waves here in 2 and ABF, um, this is not only a wide Q wave, but certainly more than 25% of the ensuing R wave. Now, this ECG also has a, a PVC, and this is in someone with dilated cardiomyopathy. If we move on a little bit uh, into the evaluation of uh, pathologic Q waves, it uh, begins with an echocardiogram. Um, I think uh, I want to just point out that in our older athletes, um, we certainly want to consider um, risk factor assessment for, for coronary artery disease and to consider if this was an individual with considerable risk factors uh, for early atherosclerotic coronary disease or an individual who's over 30 that you may well uh, consider exercise stress testing of, of some sort looking for some occult uh, CAD. There's another type of a Q wave that I just want to point out that's part of our criteria and also a little bit of a, a nuance and, and subtlety, um, and that's the anterior Q waves in V1 or V2 or what's known as a, a QS pattern, and draw your attention up to just sort of V1 and V2 where there's this uh, Q wave. This is a, a pseudoseptal infarct uh, type pattern. It can also be from uh, misplacement of the leads, V1, V2, um, where they're incorrectly placed high on the chest. So the first thing we do for this is actually repeat the ECG, and then if the ECG remains uh, abnormal with this pattern, move on to, to an echo. In that particular athlete, we actually repeated the ECG um, and, and got a more normal appearing pattern um, with an R wave and V2 and no longer needed to do any, any further assessment. <laughs> 
So if we move on quickly just to ventricular pre-excitation, and Jack will, will, will go into greater detail here, this is an example of uh, some classic findings of, of pre-excitation or Wolf-Parkinson-White, and just draw your attention to sort of the slurred upstroke of the QRS complex known as a delta wave. Um, the short PR interval, the P wave, uh, essentially goes straight into the QRS complex, uh, and, and typically in a QRS that's greater than 120 milliseconds. Another example of ventricular pre-excitation, um, obviously we have uh, that slurred upstroke and delta wave, somewhat of a wide QRS, but I want to point out a, other, a couple other findings here that um, somewhat confirm this diagnosis or suggest it. Um, the presence of a large Q wave in, in lead three, um, some ST segment depression, and also the absence of a Q wave in lead V6. These are all things that aren't in sort of the traditional diagnostic criteria for pre-excitation but are uh, often found on ECGs uh, that represent pre-excitation and, and lead towards that diagnosis. Um, so what do we do for the evaluation of individuals with, with pre-excitation? Um, I think this is important. This is one of the more common things that we find in, in our screening. Um, probably find about uh, one in uh, 200 to 250 young athletes have ventricular uh, pre-excitation. And so it's important to understand what we do from there in terms of uh, secondary evaluation. Uh, it begins for, uh, based on the, the international recommendations, uh, begins with an exercise ECG test. And this is really important because we're not just doing an exercise study, but we're actually looking for abrupt cessation of the delta wave or abrupt loss of the pre-excitation that might denote that it's a low risk pathway. If we cannot confirm that it's a low risk pathway, then I, um, the, the conversation becomes a, a, an electrophysiology study that can better characterize uh, whether or not that's a, a lower risk uh, low or high risk pathway, and if it is a high risk pathway, perhaps ablate it uh, at the time of the procedure. Also important to know that an echocardiogram is part of the workup for an individual with a WPW pattern uh, ECG because of the association uh, of, with Epstein's anomaly or cardiomyopathy um, pre-excitation. Pre this was shown nicely by work uh, with Sanjay and in individuals uh, who had uh, sudden cardiac death and pre-excitation and in post-mortem evaluation, 26% uh, 20 per of them actually had definitive cardiac pathology like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So again, an association there and one that you can rule out upfront uh, by getting some imaging studies as well. So again, our international criteria are there to help us distinguish normal from abnormal, and we have to remember the appropriate secondary evaluation of those abnormalities, and we're gonna hear more about it in the lectures to come. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.